In 1893, a Viennese journalist wrote, When I think of my son's future, I ask myself whether I have the right to make life so difficult for him as it has become for me. That is why we must baptize Jewish children, while they can still feel nothing, either for it or against it. We Jews must submerge in the people. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. It's not something you'd expect to hear from the man known as the father of Zionism. But those words were written by Theodore Herzl, who spent his life trying to solve what he called the Jewish question. Herzl was born in Budapest in 1860. At the time, the city was known as Judapest because of its large Jewish population. As a boy, he attended a Christian high school that was open to Jews. And on his 13th birthday, his parents held a confirmation ceremony instead of a bar mitzvah. Theodor Herzl was an assimilated Jew who came from an assimilated family. He was not educated in the Jewish sphere at all. And he was very, very far from Judaism. His family later moved to Vienna, where Herzl earned a law degree. But his real passion was writing. So he divided his time between writing plays, working as a reporter, and looking for a way to end anti-Semitism. Theodor Herzl is the one who sort of pulls it together, but there are many, there are Christian ministers, there are rabbis, there are all kinds, there are presidents, there are all kinds of people who are saying, wait a minute, we've got this problem. At one point, Herzl even proposed a mass baptism of Jewish babies in Vienna's largest cathedral. He believed that if Jews adopted Christian culture, they would finally be accepted by European society. But Theodore Herzl was about to get an assignment that would change his mind. It was as a journalist for the top newspaper in Vienna that he was sent to Paris to write about the wonderful French experience. Herzl, who was a bon vivant, you know, and was living in Paris and enjoying himself and going to the theater three times a week, and all of a sudden, he saw the ugly face of anti-Semitism. Herzl was assigned to cover the famous Dreyfus Affair, in which a French Jewish captain was falsely convicted of spying for the Germans. Herzl watched as Alfred Dreyfus was stripped of his medals and publicly degraded at the military school in Paris. Crowds filled the streets, shouting death to the Jews. People are inflamed and they're shouting, not down with Dreyfus, not down with the individual, they shout down with the Jews. And Theodor Herzl has his aha moment. Herzl realized that the only solution to anti-Semitism was for the Jews to have their own state. Wonderful idea. How do you go about doing it? This is where the writer of plays came in, you know. He was going to set the stage. Herzl shut himself in his apartment and wrote his ideas down for five straight days. When a friend of his visited, he was alarmed by Herzl's disheveled appearance and wild ideas. He suggested they get some fresh air. And as they walked, he told Herzl to get some medical help before someone hauled him off to a madhouse. Herzl paid no attention, and the following year, he published his most famous work, The Jewish State. Theodor Herzl, in his book, The Jewish State, dreams. And he talks about this new nation state being a beacon to humanity. He talks about it being a model democracy. Not everyone was thrilled with Herzl's ideas. Religious Jews thought it was blasphemy to reestablish the nation of Israel without the Messiah. Nevertheless, Herzl worked tirelessly to realize his vision. He even tried to buy the land of Palestine. He tried to create a situation where he will be introduced to the Sultan 
of Turkey, and he will buy the land of Israel from him. Boy, that's going to cost a lot of money. How is he going to pay for it? Well, he had the dream. He had an idea. He says, I'm going to take half of the riches of all the rich Jews. Well, of course, there was absolutely no chance that any of these people would do that. They did not want to see Zionism succeed, in fact. But he was convinced that that's the way to do it. In 1897, Herzl gathered Jewish delegates from around the world for the first World Zionist Congress. For this historic meeting, he chose the city of Basel in Switzerland. By the way, do you know why it was in Basel? It was supposed to be in Munich. And in Munich, there were Jews who called themselves Germans of the faith of Moses. And they said to him, we don't want this Jewish riffraff from all over the world coming to Munich. In August, more than 200 delegates from 17 countries arrived in Basel. It was the first representative Jewish assembly in nearly 2,000 years, and the atmosphere was electric. Behind the podium hung a white flag with two blue stripes and a Star of David, a version of the design that would be adopted by the State of Israel 50 years later. Among the delegates was a man Herzl introduced as the first Christian Zionist. The Reverend William Heckler was the British Embassy Chaplain in Vienna. He was deeply interested in the return of the Jews to Israel. So he helped Herzl make some important political connections, and the two became lifelong friends. As Herzl walked to the podium, people cheered and stomped their feet. He opened the Congress by announcing, we are here to lay the foundation stone of the house which is to shelter the Jewish nation. The applause was deafening. One English delegate described the excitement of the crowd. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept as we remembered Zion. By the rivers of Basel, we sat down and resolved to weep no more. The beautiful thing about Theodor Herzl and the beautiful thing about Zionism is that it doesn't just stop with the negative. There is anti-Semitism and there is negativity and there's a certain rejection on the part of Europe. But what they also do is, I call it the jujitsu move, where you take the negative and you turn it into something positive. A few days later, Herzl made a bold statement in his diary. At Basel, I founded the Jewish state. If I said this out loud today, I would be answered by universal laughter. Perhaps in five years, and certainly in 50, everyone will know it. Herzl's statement turned out to be prophetic. 50 years later, the United Nations approved a plan to divide Palestine into Jewish and Arab states. And nine months later, the state of Israel was born. After the Congress, Herzl, who had never been religious, started observing some Jewish traditions. That winter, instead of having a Christmas tree, the Herzl family celebrated their first Hanukkah. Despite growing health problems, Herzl traveled the globe, trying to get backers for the new state. He went first to Constantinople, then on to Jerusalem in hopes of asking the Ottoman Sultan for land. Then in the spring of 1903, the need for a Jewish state became more urgent than ever as the world turned its focus on a small town in Russia. On Easter Sunday, a group of Russian Orthodox men entered the Jewish quarter of the village of Kishinev. Led by their priest, they shouted, death to the Jews. The same cry Herzl had heard in Paris during the Dreyfus affair almost 10 years earlier. 
Eyewitnesses describe the bloody massacre that followed. Wives, along with their husbands, were shot down. A synagogue worker was killed protecting the Torah with his body. Children had their brains dashed out against the walls. And even babes were snatched from the arms of pleading mothers and hurled through windows. At sunset, the streets were piled with corpses. After three days, more than 40 Jews were killed, 92 were injured, and more than 700 homes were looted and destroyed. Four months later, the Jewish Congress convened under the shadow of the massacre, but that was just the beginning. Herzl had good news and bad news for the crowd. The good news was that Great Britain wanted to help the Jewish people. The bad news was how they wanted to help. After the Kishinev pogrom, Herzl had an emergency meeting with British politicians. He asked them for land in Cyprus or the Sinai Peninsula, both of which were under British control. The plan was to rescue the Jews from Russia and still be close to Palestine. The British refused and offered them land in British East Africa now Uganda. With no other choice, Herzl accepted the offer, and the British drew up a plan for a colony they called New Palestine. In 1903, Herzl presented the idea to the Zionist Congress with disastrous results. Zionism refers to Zion, and the plan was eventually to have Zion as the homeland. Nobody was giving this up. But for now, we're going to get ourselves a place to hide. It was the delegates from Russia, whom Herzl was trying to protect, who took the news the hardest. They stormed out of the concert hall in protest. Among them was a young man who had become the first president of the new state of Israel, Chaim Weizmann. The Zionists from Russia hated the idea so they basically mounted a revolution against him and broke his heart. And he had been dealt such a tremendous shock that everybody doesn't take his word for the gospel truth. Herzl closed the Sixth Zionist Congress by raising his right hand and reciting a verse from the Psalms. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. These were the last words he would ever speak at the podium in Basel. Only his close friends and family knew that he was suffering from heart failure. And over the next year, his health declined rapidly. He told his old friend, Reverend Heckler, greet Palestine for me. I gave my heart's blood for my people. He died the next day. And at his funeral in Vienna, more than 6,000 people gathered to honor the man they had called King of the Jews. In 1949, the new government of Israel honored Herzl's dying request. They brought his remains from Vienna and reburied them here on a hill overlooking Jerusalem. During his lifetime, Herzl was called everything from a hero to a dreamer to a heretic. But his influence on the Jewish people is undeniable. In the last decade of his life, he gave them something they hadn't had in nearly 2,000 years, the hope of going home. He was an amazing man. He deserves a lot of credit. He had a dream, and it was a good dream. But you know, there's a distance between dreaming and between bringing something to fruition. It took pioneers. It took men of action, men of work. 
Herzl was, in the words of that wonderful song, the wind beneath their wings. <laughs>